In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Imagine Epiphany as the great preacher Peter Gomes described it, like a heavy stone thrown into the very center of a great placid lake. The event itself, the plop and the splash, is over in an instant, but the ripples of the water moving and multiplying get bigger and bigger and bigger until, as he put it, the entire surface imperceptibly is witness to the initial movement of that stone. Epiphany says to us, look at what God has set in motion in the birth of that baby in the manger. Christmas is over, but we don't pack up that story in a box and put it away with the ornaments and the tree lights until next December. Instead, we open our eyes to see just how the Jesus event can be seen and felt today. We open our hearts to let those ripples move and change us. And we begin all this with baptism, an event we celebrate this morning that will be over in an instant and yet will ripple throughout the lives of these two little boys, Logan and Lucas. Baptism reveals the deepest truth of who they are. It is the central message of our Christian faith summed up in one simple word, and that word is beloved. Every Christian baptism is an echo of the divine naming of Jesus at his own baptism by John in the Jordan. When the heavens opened and a voice declared, this is my son, the beloved. Jesus' baptism by John appears in each of the four gospels, which is a fact that affirms its importance. The act both heralds and initiates Jesus' public ministry in what will turn out to be a signature mix of humbleness and grandeur. And it pairs Jesus with this odd fellow, John, who shows up to play a critical role in the beginning of Jesus' ministry before disappearing just as abruptly as he arrived. And we don't know much about John the Baptist. We know he's a Jewish prophet who has been living a strange ascetic life in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance in preparation for the coming of the Lord. And the coming of the Lord, as John describes it, is pretty frightening with its promise of fiery judgment and the splitting of good from bad by a grim-faced God. The urgency of John's warning is fueled by his conviction that the water baptism he offers is only the beginning of God's much larger plan. And he, he keeps telling the people who gathers at the river, someone more powerful than I is coming soon to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And in our lesson today, that someone shows up. Jesus strides without ceremony into the midst of the anxious, guilty, excited throng. And when John sees him, a light bulb goes off. He recognizes Jesus immediately as that someone they've all been waiting for. And the two of them have a little back and forth. John protests that Jesus really should be the one baptizing him. And Jesus, without disagreeing, insists that what matters right now is righteousness and fulfillment and a commitment to doing things God's way. And God's way turns out to be pretty dramatic. Jesus is baptized by John, and as he comes up out of the water, the heavens open, and the Spirit descends like a dove, and it alights on Jesus as a voice from above makes crystal clear that this man, with the water dripping down his beard, is indeed the person John recognizes him to be, God's beloved and obedient son. Now, the Bible does not make clear why 
Jesus needs to be baptized when presumably he has no need of repentance. John is definitely confused about it. As far as we know, Jesus himself never baptized anyone, not even his disciples. And it's not clear who else, if anyone, hears that voice from heaven and sees that dove. But something is triggered by that baptism. Something that energizes and inaugurates Jesus' agency on earth. And from this point onward, Jesus is actively living out and showing forth and grappling with the truth of his identity. And the ripples he creates reveal something brand new and astonishing to the world about the truth of God and the truth of God's people. So this all brings me back to that word, beloved. The introduction of John the Baptist and Jesus by the banks of the Jordan in Matthew's Gospel give us two very different views of God, don't they? The first is the God reflected in John's preaching. John, who imagines the face of God as wearing a perpetual frown. Disappointed in humankind, punishing and judgmental, critical of human desires, this God is a scorekeeper of our many flaws and failings. The kingdom of God is near, John warns the people, and you better get straight, you better get clean, or God is going to scrape you off and toss you away without a second thought. The second view of God is the image made known to us in Jesus. It is the face of God we recognize as that of a loving parent, much like the faces of these loving parents who bring their beloved children to be baptized today. Faces that gaze at their children, even when they're fussy, gaze at them with delight and wonder as they whisper over and over, I love you. Where John sees deadbeats and degenerates, Jesus sees brothers and sisters and is not ashamed to say so. And Jesus gets busy right away, healing and forgiving and restoring and rejoicing in them, preaching the kingdom of God not as a place of division and exclusion, but a place of wholeness and reunion, a place where the fullness of human identity as beloved in God's sight is realized. Now, both of these perceptions of God are alive and well in the Christian church, for better and for worse. As a result, Christians around the world have very different ideas and beliefs about what baptism is. Some embrace John's vision. They've been taught about original sin and believe that humanity's consistent rejection of the law and rebellion against God deserve to be punished and need to be washed away. Others of us understand the foundation of both the creation story and Jesus' baptism to be blessing and belovedness. We believe in a God who is generous, not withholding, a God who cherishes and forgives as only a loving parent can and will go to any length to prove it. Notice that at the beginning, <clears throat> at our Lord's baptism, Instead of holding himself apart and staying well above the fray of humanity's brokenness and transgressions, Jesus wades right in. He is baptized in the same water as all the rest of the flotsam and jetsam. And it is in that moment, when he is there in the midst, that he is called beloved by God. And in that moment, we believe, the ripples of our own belovedness begin. Now, I don't mean to suggest that God is not dismayed and even infuriated with much of what he, we human beings do and say to one another, with our self-centeredness and materialism and our hypocrisy and cruelty. But the God Jesus reveals in word and deed is the God of mercy and forgiveness and justice, the God who calls even the least of us, especially the least of us, beloved, and I am convinced that this central Christian message of belovedness is perhaps the greatest gift our church has to offer our world, our world today. Because we, and especially our children, 
are vulnerable as never before to an onslaught of caustic and crippling messages from the digital world. Loneliness and despair are on the rise as more and more of us absorb the poisonous verdict that we will never be good enough, that we are unlovable, that we are alone. These are lies, and they are wreaking violent and permanent damage. And as a church, we must face them down. We must face them down, not just as individuals, but as a community. And this requires of us doing more than paying lip service to the promises of our baptism and the promise that we are beloved. So, let others see you turning down the volume on voices that judge and diminish and reject. And in the meantime, turn up the promises of your own baptism. You're about to say them again this morning. You will promise to uphold these two little boys as the ripples of their Christian identity as beloved children of God make themselves known in this world. You will promise to help them and every child and every person trust that they are worthy and precious and deserving. You will make sure they know that their belovedness will never hinge on the trophies they win or how they book on Instagram, or the college they get into, or the money they make. How, you may ask? How will you keep these promises? By speaking and acting as one who knows your own belovedness. With that Jesus mix of humility and grandeur. By depending on God and on this community of faith to remind you who you are. And by living as a witness to the light of the star and the weight of a stone and the power of a God who wades into the dark waters with you and whispers, I know you, I love you, while lifting each one of us to the light because this is what we do for the beloved. Amen.